Welcome to Celtic Stuff Live on the CLNS Media Network, the leading online provider of audio and video coverage for your Boston Celtics. John and I have not been around in a while, and uh, not so coincidentally, neither have the Celtics. <laughs> Either for injury issues, which is really ridiculous right now. I mean, what yeah. was it? Eight, eight players, John? Did I have that right? Yeah, eight. That's ridiculous. <clears throat> yeah. I, mean, I just don't even know, like, and all the postponed games, you know, like the Nats and. Yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of, it's, it's, I don't want to be like, oh, it's so frustrating, you know, that games are being postponed and whatever, and people are sitting out on protocol and whatnot, but it is kind of frustrating because they're going to march through this season anyway. And they kind of need to. It's kind of like the new reality right now, I guess. But it is it is tough to get a quality product. You look at somebody like Josh Richardson and just finally starts getting it going and then turn down, he's out. It's rough. Yeah, yeah, it is rough. I mean, it, it really stinks to be, you know, trying to get some, some momentum by this season. And, you know, it, but, you know, I mean, look, the – NBA is the lowest of priorities, probably, as we're all kind of navigating mm-hmm. through Omicron. Um, Omicron Prime. Um, and uh, <laughs> feels like a- I was going to go with the Oh my God. <laughs> well, <there laughs> so, you go. Yeah, that works. Yeah, that we works. were both thinking puns there. That's funny. It, it yeah, but it's, it, it's, yeah, but it, in terms of the basketball side of it, right? It's, this is a team that needs to figure itself out. And I don't know, this is really what we need right now. <laughs> you know, we need to be able to uh, figure out kind of where, you know, how to win games, how to play consistent. And you got guys in and out and, you know, so they play, they play Philly up 97, 90, uh. and, you know, or whatever it was, they're up by seven with like three minutes to go. And then they just gack um gack the game away and uh yeah but okay no rob they definitely missed al no horford, horford on that one yeah no no you know grant um no josh richardson you know look not to say philly wasn't missing guys i mean philly had to lose a game Maxie last weekend was out. yeah right um do i feel like we win if there's a game between the guys who were out versus their guys who were out yeah um, but it doesn't work that way. So, um, you know, the game, yeah, how do you the defend Embiid? How do you defend Embiid in that scenario? And he did, he had a huge night so. 41 and, you know, and, and the shot that really clinched it was a fade away. Yeah. That fade 20, away on the baseline, 20 from footer, off. fall yeah. out of bounds. I mean, Crazy. you can't ask for a better shot that ask for forcing him into a better shot than that. And if you make right. it, you make it. So, I'm not, I'm not, but too when he made it, that. but when he made it, it was beautiful. I mean, the way that that dropped through the net, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't like it rattled. No, I mean, he was in the zone when he released yeah. that for sure. Yeah. No, he, you know, and, and that's, I mean, look, he's done this before. Um, I think it's a bit frustrating that the sellers weren't able to force someone else to beat them. I, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I just, I always feel like that's what they need to do, particularly in a situation where it's Cantor against, um, you know, I'd rather see, um, you know, Tobias Harris get some shots or, or Danny green or, you know, some uh, Isaiah Joe. I mean, I'd rather see those guys shooting the ball than, you know, Joel Embiid personally, but there's a reason why he's that good, I suppose. But yeah, it, it's, it was a frustrating game, but it, it's just, it's just emblematic of where they are right now, which is they're where good. they've been, they can compete. Yeah. Where they can compete. Um, but they don't have it figured out and they can't have, they don't have enough that they can rely upon to say, okay, this is what we need. And this is how we can close this out. It's just not consistent enough. Yeah. It's tough with, with younger players and younger lead stars too, because you really do need that consistency with the rotations and everything else. And it's part of the reason that they brought in all these vets, but then here we are looking at, you know, players like Peyton Pritchard, and uh, and your boy, your favorite. Come on, you know, little small forward, six foot seven. My favorite, 
Yeah. Like, is is D Smith my favorite? All of a sudden. Yeah, you love really? D Smith. Yeah, he's definitely oh, okay. a favorite of yours. Yeah, yeah. Come on, you're always talking about giving these Smith well, a run. And I, I think yeah, but it's less about D Smith specifically than it is about the idea of it, right? The idea of you've taken the guy 14th, and you don't give him a chance to play. Right. It just is weird. It's and, like the opposite of Langford. You know, what do we take well, him at 15? No, yeah, no, same he, idea though. No, well, both same both idea, but there. he, yeah, but he kept himself out, right? Well, right, like, right. So he was injured. So sure. kind of, kind of the same scenario, but for a different reason. That, but you also need what Neesmith provides, and and I'm not so yeah, stupid. shooting. I'm not stupid enough to think that just because he doesn't shoot well when he gets you know nine minutes, five minutes, or yeah. every other third week. Uh, that doesn't show me that he can't shoot the ball. It shows me that he can't shoot the ball when he gets inconsistent, you know, Minutes opportunity. Time. Yeah. You know, and that's, the, that's what I don't understand. Nobody seems to like, this is like my biggest frustration with the NBA right now. Like my biggest frustration is fans who don't understand that, who don't understand that Sadiq Bay you know, kind of popping off last year and, oh, he's so much better than Aaron Neesmith and I knew all along or whatever. Like, go look at Sadiq Bay's shooting percentages right now. Kid's shooting 31% oh, I know. from three. He's I know. He was, like on, my, he was on my fantasy team like, and I had to drop him. Yep. He got, but you get opportunity, and it's like you know, it's like the Garrison Matthews thing. This is this is like the new. He thing, is also right? on my fantasy team now. Sure, it's smart, right? He's getting opportunity, so he plays, so he gets a lot of shots. He gets a lot, you know, it's great, no problem. But like the idea that, well, uh, you know, they were good and we didn't know. That's not really the case, is it? Like, are they good now, but they weren't good when they were here? No, I, or, you know, at least in Garrison Matthews case, no, the, there's no opportunity. You know, we can say, well, they aren't taking the opportunity. Well, some of this you have to force feed. You, It's just how that's how it works. You have to force feed opportunity. Mm-hmm. In a way, Peyton Pritchard has been force fed opportunity in these last two games, and he's taken it by the horns here uh, against New York and against Philly. So that's that's what I'm talking about. And that's why you say, you know, do I, I don't mind the idea of trading a guy like Dennis Schroeder because I think that in the opportunity that eventually what you get out of Peyton Pritchard, yeah, you're going to have some stinkers. You're going to have some games where he's going to look like a second year player who can't get by as a guy. He's going to, you're going to have some games where he can't defend his way out of a paper bag. I mean, all of those things are, can be true at the same time, but he's a first round pick who can shoot the hell out of the ball. And seems to have some pretty good offensive, you know, kind of awareness of himself, which seems to work pretty well next to Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. But let's just keep running out Dennis Schroeder because he can get to the paint and look off Jalen Brown wide open in the corner and turn the ball over a hundred times. Get back to me on that one. Eme. I, I don't understand that, but that's, that's where we're at. And I think, I, for me, as as kind of looking at this, and, I'm, and I guess this is where we kind of come back to the bigger picture. If this is who they are, then I'm not saying we, we tank, but I'm saying we should be looking at improving our stock of the players we have now and have, have, have will have over the, over the next run. And that means Aaron Neesmith, Peyton Pritchard, Romeo Langford, Grant Williams. Yeah. Make them the best you can over the next whatever it is, 60 games. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense because it's kind of a lost season anyway, right? So, I mean, it's not a lost season, but they're clearly not climbing the ladder, right? Right. (laughs) I know not everybody gets video, but I swear to God, dude, you just like looked up the ceiling. Like, I'm like, it's a lost season. And it was literally like you were looking for it. Like, I'm looking for it. I'm did, looking for the season. Where, where is did it? it go? Is it yeah, there? you were like, no, that's a cobweb. There's, that's all I got. <laughs> it is a lost season, though. You're totally right. I mean, it's, I, I hate saying that. It's not even January, no. but I no, like it is. I'm not saying it's a lost postseason, but I'm saying it's a lost season. So right. to your point, like sometimes you just gotta throw the towel in on, you know, expectations. 
right and trying to meet expectations right and in, and instead you got to just go with it's it's time to focus on development it's time to focus on right you know, and and why not trade Schroeder at this point you know or why not package some players and maybe it is to go get a Beal. And then maybe you're trying to get the chemistry right for the postseason. Or maybe right. you're, you know, there's there's other players that are out there that we've talked about. Trade season is sort of open. You know, it's not really active, but it's sort of open. Right. Your conversations and rumors will start flying. I see it all over my Facebook feed now. It's like, oh, this move, you know, we'll put them over the top. And, da, 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 da. and you know, most of it's kind of, you know, nonsense right now. But. I don't see why you don't make a consolidation pick. You know, I don't, at this point, I don't think depth is, I mean, depth is important, but when you got eight players out anyway, and then the depth is preventing you from playing young players, you you might as well try to do a move to consolidate. Not saying that that's going to be on the table for them, but I guess the question is, do you think that Brad would give up picks? Cause Danny was really like, you know, he was a picks hoarder almost to a, almost to a fault over his final years in Boston, mm-hmm. right? He would hoard those picks and then not move them when he should have. And then he got too many picks and not enough to do with the picks that he's making, like not enough playing time and, or, or a whole bunch of late ones and, mm-hmm. you know, move them earlier and they might've had value. Right. So timing is everything with that. Do you think Brad is going to hoard picks? Because one of the other reasons is to round out the bench with talent right at a low cost but then you kind of if you look at it and you look at their strategy for how they're going to build a team you might as well mm-hmm. grab them from the g league you know if they're not going to get any playing time why make a pick it, dude g league players are cheap and they're they all can play a role so why wouldn't you consolidate the talent on the team as much as you can and then if there's not a chemistry fit you do what every other team in the league does spin them off and go get somebody else you know and do your thing. So let's let's just take a while doing the, the devil's advocate thing and walk in, you know, kind of talking about the, the other side of our mouth and say, okay, look, let's look at last year's team, right? Yeah. Last year's team lacked veteran leadership on the bench, lacked reliable players around Tatum and Brown, especially with um, Kemba's injury, you know, injured status. And, you know, he wouldn't play one night and they would play the next. And, they, they struggled to gain some consistency. Well, that part seems familiar, but, but that's like, that's where we are with this, you know, this group in terms of the outcome, the outcome is the same. So it, it's, you know, how much do you need to have as part of a team as part, you know, as part of the core of a team to allow you to still have enough of a, of, of enough, you know, respect enough, you know, know how enough, you know, kind of grizzled veteranness about your roster so that you can still maintain, you know, enough players on the court that know what they're doing. Meanwhile, at the same point, provide an opportunity for the young players. And last year we saw, it seemed, I'm not, I'm not saying I necessarily agree with this, but it seemed that we had too much of, of the young and not enough of the old, which is why we go back and we get Cantor freedom. We get, we get Josh Richardson, we get Schroeder, right? So we add those three guys and then, well, now we've got veterans, so it'll be fine. I don't feel that. <laughs> yeah, I don't feel not like this season. I, I don't, and, and I don't know that last year it was like, oh, well, well, you know, th- that was the problem. I felt like the problem last year was Brad never went fully in on what he needed to do. He had the team to play one way and we kept trying to kind of force his way with Thompson. And, and, and <laughs> I thought that was really what kind of set him back. He was trying to force into you something. Like the Thompson and Tice. Yeah. Like these yeah. are, these are my quote unquote best players. So right. I'm going to play those players. Yeah. That kinda is like playing Rob this Williams year and Horford yeah. together. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. I don't, I, I agree with you that, 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 that's a disjointed, I mean, Rob work. is super move. Like he can move, but, but it, it, mm. we have to just accept Jason Tatum is a modern power forward. We yeah. just have to accept that fact. Yeah. 
He is. I, I think we have to accept that he, the kid is six ten. Sucks for me because that's not what I want. But I think you're right. Well, but but you know what though? Like I still think that there is another forward the team gets that maybe does what you want them to do as well. Like I think the problem is is finding that guy who can fill that role is just for the amount of uh, draft capital or or whatever it would take to acquire that guy. It's just not worth it. Like yeah. it, the, the market is, is just upside down on that right now. So you have to play Tatum there. You have to play Brown at the three. And then you've got Romeo and you've got Neesmith and you got smart. And your point guard situation is, uh, you know, mm. if you have the right shooting guard or, or, you know, whoever the third, the next wing that can answer a lot more questions about the smart versus Pritchard versus a different point guard who can get in the lane and create um, that's, you know, they're there, but you need to fill out that other piece to figure out what you need a point guard, or you figure out what you need a point, what you get a point guard and you consolidate and then you get whatever you get left over at, at that other other wing spot, because, you know, there's, you know, there's been a lot of talk of the DeJounte Murray's and the, um, the De'Aaron Foxes and a few other guys with D in front of their name. No, not really. I'm just DeJon DeJon and De'Aaron. anyway, um, it, that's somewhat kind of interesting to me because I never really wanted to spend much on a point guard um, because I think that they're pretty easily found. And I still believe that on the other hand, um, if the market is so crazy to add that three, four who can rebound, so do you, whatever, you, why so don't we you, just take the one we have that we're maxed out and he's the best player at that position. Right. So do you want smart at shooting guard Brown at small forward Tatum at power forward and then you choose Robert Horford, depending on matchups or how the rotation kind of gels. And then you you get a real point guard who can distribute and smart plays defensive, mostly less ball in his hands. Ideally, no. I mean, so ideally, you, ideally, you're trading. I, ideally, him. I you're still, trading him. I don't but, see how dude, I don't if see, you don't want him at shooting guard. And you don't want him at point guard. Yeah, point guard is the only place trading. you play him. I think the only place you play him is a point guard. I think he's a point guard. I don't think he's yeah. a shooting guard. You know, I, think I don't he, think he's a shooting guard either, but if you have Tatum and Brown facilitating most yeah. of the offense, then he's that defensive guy at shooting. Right. Guard. But that's not really the point I'm even making. I'm just saying, you personally, if you don't want him at shooting guard and you don't want him at point guard, there's only one thing that's left. You got to trade him. Yeah. He deserves an opportunity to start. So if he's not starting for your, meaning not the Royal, your, but your the John Royal Duke's we. Boston Celtics. It's the Royal right? we. Yes. Yes. Our, your, your <laughs> Boston Celtics, John, if he's not starting for your Boston Celtics, he's getting traded. If you're Brad, I, I think he is closer to being traded now than he ever has been. Yeah. And it's not because of anything he's done. I think it's just merely a function of what does this team need right now? And I'm not sure they're close enough to contention where his value is as important as it needs to be. Yeah. You know, I yeah. think at this point they need talent. I think they need talent above all else. And they really need somebody who can move the ball around and yeah. facilitate the offense. That's really that's kind bad. of my sense. Yeah. That's somebody. I agree. Who, they need somebody who can either get in the lane and create, you know, find the shooters in the corners, you know, break down the defense. I don't believe that Tatum and Brown are the, that guy. I don't, I just don't think they are. I don't think that they are. Um, I think they bring too much of the defense with them for them to really be able to create. Now they've started to create for each other a little bit better, which has been really interesting and, and actually has made watching Celtics games over the last week, a lot more fun than it had been. Um, and I'm hoping we kind of continue with that because I want to see how far this can go. Um, we've, you know, we've heard over and over why it won't work. Well, I'd, I'd like to see us try to make it work. Okay, let's shift. We're going to go to Danny in Utah. Dude, I'm going to tell you right now, there is a story behind this puppy. There's a major story behind this puppy and they're not letting it out. But there's a story. 
he got his ass booted for sure. Telling you. You think so? Yeah. Yeah. Something happened, dude. Something happened. Think about the way that he says, I didn't really expect, like he, he's so good at, you know, taking the high road and, Mm -hmm. and everything else, but just, just pay attention to a couple of the little things in that whole conversation. Right. And one of them is I didn't really expect them to put Brad in that position. Now, if you think back to when we talked about all this, it was like, yeah, they're probably transitioning out. It was probably around February and they had like, you remember our narrative on this, right? Mm -hmm. They probably had the plan and Brad was going to come in. It was like a succession thing. And no, dude, Danny, Danny told you if you were listening that they had no freaking clue what they were going to do when they let him go, which means he was dismissed for sure. Nobody decides to just transition with no plan for who's going in that seat. And the person that's about to get succeeded, not knowing who's taking their seat, Danny would never, no business out there in the world would tell their vice president of sales, their GM, their VP of ops. Hey man, you know, we're going to replace you, but we don't know who, but why don't you just go ahead and go now? That conversation only happens as a, we had enough of you here. It's time for you to go. Nobody does that. Nobody. I, it just, it seems, okay. My belief in this is that Danny was always Pagliuk's guy. And that's why and wick went along with pagliuca because he didn't have he didn't have any any really any sort of credentials or or know anybody in the league pagliuca was the guy who knew people and so when pagliuca brought in um danny it was like okay well it's a perfect marriage well is that where is the ownership now is the ownership now i'm not pagliuca is still you know alternate governor or, or whatever it may be um and meanwhile danny's buddy ryan smith just bought the utah jazz this spring um i i mean i do think that there is a mutual i think it was a mutual parting i don't think it was now but i don't think it was no way why do you say no way like that because, I mean, because they would have planned for it they didn't plan Brad moved up in the role for yeah, all the reasons at- that we decided because it was financial. You know, he's kind of burning out as a coach. He yeah. kind of lost the team and they had all this money wrapped up in him. So it just made sense to elevate sure. him and yeah. give him a shot. And they had Mike Zarin and they have all, and they have Austin Ange. They had all these other people wrapped up around him that even if Brad was mediocre, you know, they couldn't spend their money a better way and get, mm-hmm. you know, much better results. Right. So it just, it was, it wound up being the natural choice, which then again brings me to why didn't they plan for that? Like if they went shopping for somebody and they're like, Hey, we're going to make Tom Thibodeau, the GM, or, you know, like, Oh, this person's coming up. Let's see if we can't grab, you know, let's see if we can't bring Ryan McDonough back or, you know, whatever. Right. But, Mm -hmm. um, but that, that, that clearly, wasn't like they they had no plan and and ultimately they knew they were handcuffed by brad's salary and they weren't gonna they wanted to go with elevate him and get a new coach and i i'm i'm shocked that that wasn't decided you know before danny decided to step down leave the team ask to leave whatever Mm. i just for them to land on brad you know, like if they had shopped it out and they had said, it's just time for a change. And, you know, Danny, you're, you're kind of crusty and, you know, it's time. And, you know, it was mutual, blah, 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 blah. And they did like a full on, you know, search. But even the search was half ass, dude. They didn't really bring anybody in for GM. Oh, yeah. No, no, definitely not. Definitely not. Would, so, I mean, if they had put any forethought into Danny stepping down, they would have already come to this conclusion. 
but if they were going to let Danny go, why wouldn't they have gone out and, and tried to seek out a wider audience? But that's my point. That's right. my point. But like, why wouldn't they? Because of the I, money? I, it's probably the money. But the point, the point isn't really like, why didn't they do it? The point is, is if they knew they were going with Brad, why did Danny just tell us he had no idea that that was going to be the move? And then all of a sudden, he's not with the organization. They wind up moving Brad up, and now he's in Utah after saying he was going to take a bunch of time off and didn't even make it a season. Something's fishy, dude. Something well, is I, super fishy. I, I'm here. fine with. I, I'm fine. With, okay. I mean, I, I don't know that I. I'm not as. I think that there was more unhappiness on the ownership side than was portrayed in the public. I yeah, I agree sure. with. The, I agree with that. I, I agree with that part of it. And I think that there was unhappiness with both sides. I think it was mutual. I think, I think, I don't think ownership was happy. With you don't think we mutual separation. I don't you think, just think mutual, not happy. I think mutual, not happy. Right. I think everybody was miserable last year. I thought the players were miserable. The coaches were miserable. The ownership was miserable and the GM was miserable. Nothing had worked out the way it was supposed to. Over the last Isn't it years. great that they're still miserable? <laughs> well, that's right. And what is it? So what does that tell you? Right. That, that to me is the problem with this year is that we changed everything else and we're right back where we started. Same from, place. Yeah. So that's, that's why I say like, you need a change in, in philosophy and we really haven't changed philosophy. We, we kind of have, Still being still playing veteran players more than they probably deserve, still, you know, not playing, building up our assets, still not taking our assets and maximizing them so that you can turn them into bigger and better players. Um, so do you think Danny wanted to do that and Brad wouldn't do it as the coach? And then that's part of the reason why Danny also wanted to because if you think about how he built the team that brought Garnett, right. you know, there was a whole different approach to exactly what you're saying right i mean we still got frustrated and said doc play the young guys but danny basically took the young guys took the vets away from doc and said well if you're not going to do it then you know i'm just going to make it happen and right. then all of a sudden he had young guys playing and he had draft ca- not draft well i guess it's still draft capital they're on their rookie contracts yeah he was able to move them around you know and he had you know a salary in wally zerbiak which helped him get Ray Allen and everything else. So let, let's shift on this a little bit. You know, I want to talk about another old friend who played for the, uh, who is playing for the Lakers, you know, seriously, the whole jinx started with Isaiah. Would you guys just bring him back on a 10 day for Christ's sake, bring him back on a seriously, 10 day and just see if we can't write this shit. It's weird. At this point, so it's weird. weird. Like it's, it's really bizarre at this point. There is nobody who wants to be a Boston Celtic more than Isaiah Thomas. And yeah, in a reserve role, right. Whatever role you give him. And yet, (laughs) I don't know. It's, it's frigging perplexing. So weird, dude. It really is. Like Kyrie is gone. Like, please write the ship before it's too late. If you don't get the karma circle, right. All we have is yin. (laughs) We have no Yang. No Yang. We, we got to get the Yang. You got to right. bring Isaiah back and Yang this ship because <laughs> the yaw the is out of control. Like we yeah. are not sailing straight. No. And it's bad, dude. And and I don't, you know, look, it's just, <laughs> I just don't get it. Like, I don't, I don't understand what is, like, is he really like that bad? Like, is he that? And, and yet over and over we see he, he, goes out i mean we've we just signed cj miles 15 year veteran yeah not you know, isaiah like, we can't do him this is the thing like i i i've been such a believer in the danny Ainge school since 2003 i mean ever since he came yeah, in here me too 99 of those moves that danny made i was fully on board with right and the Kemba move retrospect very bad move right um you know and, and you know you could say the the Isaiah, the the move for Kyrie was a bad move, but I understand I understood it at the time. Um, but there's just seems to be like a growing 
sense of and part of it's because you haven't we haven't won lately we haven't been great lately Mm -hmm. winning cures all ills but how like (laughs) how many how many perplexing things are we going to have before we start like rioting (laughs) you know as a fan base like no the riot already started it's happening 14 was not a fun year but that was a team that danny was was trying to deconstruct and rebuild in a new image. Yeah. At this point, I don't know what we're doing. I don't know where we're going. I don't know what our purpose is. I don't know what we're trying to build around. Um, we, you know, there were some ideas about a switching defense and, you know, we had some games where we, we were playing in the eighties and, and it was kind of like, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. Is that where we're going with this? And then we go on a West coast trip and we give up a hundred, you know, 50,000 points every night. Um, and yes, Jalen Brown was out. So that has a lot to do with that, but, mm-hmm. but the, the kind of the listing and the move from this to that, to the other, it's like. I can't keep track of what we want this team to be. And that's, I guess, what I'm trying to find out is what do we want this team to be? And um, are we going to start making moves to in the same way Danny did in 14, where he started to kind of take the pieces and like strip it down to the, to the essentials. You can only do that so much. Maybe the answer is you can't do that because you actually have players that you're trying to build around and win with, but I'm so unimpressed with where we are right now that it seems like you have to commit to something. And right now it doesn't feel like we've committed to anything at the moment. Yeah. And it's tough to commit when you, you know, the lineup is just a complete shambles night in and night out. I do understand that, but to your point, the commitment to Horford and, and uh, Lob Lob Williams, it just doesn't fit, you know, it doesn't yeah. fit. And they need to get, they need to just, they need to get more up tempo They're And they're trying to play that way anyway. Like a lot of times they're, I don't want to say they're giving up on defense because they're not giving up, but they are just trying to score a bunch of points. And, and you've heard me probably this time last year say, I think you should do that. I think you should try to get into that game a little bit so that the players build confidence and then start tightening the defensive rotations. But you can't do that with a double big lineup. It doesn't work with a double big lineup. And so are you going to get up and go or not? Are you going to run these Clydesdales or not? Because, you know, I, I kind of think they want to play that way. This would be my one asterisk before we wrap up. Some of these players, when their contracts come up again next time, if they want to play West Coast style ball, they're going to go to the West Coast. <laughs> so... Are you going to let them play West coast style ball and let them have some fun out there and get their confidence and get there? Cause here's the other thing. Look at them, look at them for two years. Now they look miserable out there. Most of the time, even when they get excited about a big shot, it's not in joy, dude. They're not excited out of joy. They're excited out of frustration. Seriously. You know what I mean? They get this expression of pent up frustration and anger. Like, yeah, Got you. You know, they're not out there like, man, we are so Steph Curry smooth right now, bro. Oh, yeah. You know, they're not doing that. And they haven't enjoyed this for a long time. And it's all over their faces. Yeah. Every training camp, that rejuvenation, that resetting, it makes them feel good. And you kind of get that vibe like, oh, here we go. Here we go. And they have to buy into it. And they do. They got a break. They rested from it, but here we are again, finding ourselves in this like grind mentality where it's just wearing on them. So let them run, let them, let them turn into an offensive show. Let's take the turnovers, the good with the bad. You know, I bet, I bet if they did that in 10 days or 10 games, whichever comes second, you know, like, well, not, we'd always come second, but you know, in, in one of those, like in that window, 10 days to 10 games, I bet that they start to button it all up because I think they'll start to have some fun. And, you know, I don't care how much defense matters. Offense is what people enjoy players included players included. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't let them go out there and have fun, it's going to be a struggle. You know, 
Doc always, Doc got Paul and Ray and Kevin to buy into a very defensive oriented team. And it worked because KG said, screw the offense, my role. And, and if you've watched anything as possible on Showtime, which I hope you have John, but if not, you're still missing out. You know, he said, I just decided I was going to be the defensive guy on this team, which immediately allowed Paul and Ray to take a little bit more prominent role in the offense. And you know, was it up tempo? No, but those guys got got their fix offensively, but it also got everybody as a result to commit to the defensive plan. That is especially Doc River style is incredibly hard to get players to buy into. It just is because it's not as much fun and they play the game for offense. Everybody likes to shoot the ball. You want to know why? Because basketball is a shooter's game. And it's all we talk about is shooters and shooters and shooters. And why doesn't this team have shooters? This team doesn't have shooters because nobody freaking shoots the goddamn ball because we don't play up tempo because we don't get out on the break. This team doesn't shoot, doesn't have shooters because they don't shoot. They play defense, right? And then they ISO. That's not shooting. It's not basketball. And they got to get their heads out of their asses and say, you know what? Boston's got to play West Coast. It's got, they got to, these guys are young. They got springy legs. They can take a pounding, you know, maybe not Jalen Brown, but they got to run, dude. They got to let them run. Honor friggin' Tommy for once, please (laughs) get out on the break. Yeah. I, I, I think there's some truth in what you're saying. I mean, I do think that the joy that those guys need. And I, frankly, I think that part of that is, um, not just not just trying to run but also trying to strip away expectation right i mean that that's why i i guess partly i kind of feel like look let's let's run with the kids let's get rid of the old guys and let's go all in on this and get everyone to figure their their stuff out yeah figure out tatum how to to be the guy and when to go and when not to go and when to all the pass, things they never create. really got a chance to do when they were younger because Bingo. they were surrounded by vets. Use the this, things that Embiid yeah. and Simmons and you know exactly uh, yep yeah, uh, Mitchell, all of these younger players right. around the league. Yeah, well, maybe not Mitchell. Mitchell might have had you know the luxury of being on a competitive team, but yeah, but, but they, they were but they still grew. There was no them. expectations. They, they, right, right, right. That's the thing. They've yeah. had expectations on them. So do them a favor, Brad. Get rid of the expectations. Ship everybody out. Say, and let them run. Let them run. And then build your defense up that way. Yeah. You know, it. I think that that's, I think that there's a lot of truth in what you're saying there. Yeah. You know, and you don't want to lose the value of defense and you don't want to lose. Cause that's why you have e That's why you, that's why Brad coached the way he did defense is important, but, but I think, I think the it's way more important, important in the postseason. if, if well, they can sure. get, if they yeah. have the joy for the game and they have the energy and they have the legs and everything, and you get them to get on the right momentum heading into the postseason, sky's the limit. But, but we all know they're not good enough to win in the post in the post. No, not now. So it's like, well, great. We'll be a defensive team. We'll grind out a seven game first round series and lose in seven. And, and then what? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that we need to have, we need to have higher aspirations as a team. And the only way that's going to happen is by developing our young guys and getting our best players to play at all NBA levels. And, and frankly, it's going to be more difficult to do that on the offensive end than the defensive end. Find yeah. a way for Jalen and Jason to work off of each other. Look, Jalen got 30 points last night, right? That was great. Tatum was kind of taking a back seat and, and all that. But in the second half, you know, they closed that game and they're kind of clunky. They can't kind of, they can't you know really what they should do it out. And, and I think that that's part of the issue is like, you got to play those guys got to play through each other a lot for a long time, not just in crunch time. So that way it works out in those last few minutes as well. 
it should be a tale of two halves though they, because jason's a better closer than jalen is most of the time mm-hmm. other than the three pointers so they always get off to a really crappy start it seems like so they should let jalen i you know iso and drive and try to attack the paint to create space on the perimeter so let let jalen be the focal point of the first half and let jason be the focal point of the second half until they get that marriage. Like I know where you're going and you're right, but, but I think allowing them to each ha- like, Hey, Jalen, you're our first half guy, Jason, you're our second half guy. And you guys have to learn how to play off of each other in that yeah. various role, but at least we're chunking out by a half. And then you start to get situational with it. Like, because, Hey, that worked when you did that, let's throw that in, in the fourth quarter. You know, because that gets that gets us an open look. So then, in the final two minutes, you you throw it all at the other team. Yeah, I, and I th- I think that's I, I think that can work. But I but to to pick apart Jalen for a second, it feels like he has these moments where he goes kind of just white hot, like mm-hmm. he can't be stopped. But it's like he's the only player on the court. Yeah, and and nobody can stop him, but but he's not really playing with anybody through anybody, you know, he's just doing his thing. But that's why I think it makes so much sense to start the game that way. Right. Cause they're so disjointed. They're all like, but he has freaking to, I'm, stupid about getting in the flow. I guess my point is he has to, he's got to change. Like, yeah, he's got, it's not going to be. And I know what you're saying. You're saying like, if you put it here, then, it, you know, but like, that's, Jalen has yeah, such he has an to ability as a player that way. To, right. He has such an ability, like, okay, we know you can score, Jalen, but can you get six here and then you know kind of help set someone else up here and then get six again? Or, you know, rather than like I scored 24 points in a quarter, <laughs> right? Took every single shot. No, you know, no one it's else. Part of the reason he the gets ball. hurt. It's part of the reason he gets he, hurt. He just because it's a lot of demand and load on him in a short period of time. Yeah, it, yeah it's I it's agree. not helpful. It's not it's not it's um this is gonna sound bad, but it's like um it's like how you get empty baskets or empty points on a bad team. Right. Is that type of stuff. And and that's why and I'm not saying he's good player, bad team guy, um, but but he has to evolve to be more. I think Jason has made that evolution. Um, and I think he, he was more in tune anyway, but I think he's made much more of that evolution. Jalen, I'm still not feeling that. And that's where if he can find that kind of, okay, now we got this, now we got that. And part of that might be them playing through each other. And that might be the, the trigger. It needs that the Jalen respects Jason enough to, to, to I like, can't just go. You know, or they just need a, a distributor, but I got to tell you, I'm turning into a pumpkin. So I got to, I got to wrap good. this puppy, but I will wrap say, it. I think, I think if they had an appropriate ball handler who really knew how to get people into their spots, they would gain the confidence that Jalen's look. It's, it's not, you're saying Tatum should be the fix. And I'm saying smarts, the problem instead on oh. that, because I just don't, That's I don't see the two. Yeah. But I just don't see Jalen and, and Marcus playing off of each other at all either no you know? not at and, all and, and that's the real issue you know if you the, the two of them got to figure it out because they can't both just shoot three pointers and and handle the ball the way they do there's only room for one player like that on the floor and it probably should be jason and not either of those guys so mm-hmm. um you know that's really what it boils down to so that's gonna do it for this week's show but as a reminder you can follow southern stuff live on twitter at csl underscore tweet live you can follow john at CSL underscore Duke. I'm at CSL underscore Justin. As always, a heartfelt thank you to everybody for tuning in. And on behalf of the founder of CLNS Media, Nick Gelso, my co-host, John Duke, I'm Justin Poole. And thank you for listening to this long-awaited. I got some emails and tweets and and messages from you all out there. We definitely took a long time. Uh, Heartfelt thank you for tuning in and waiting patiently. Uh, But that's going to do it. Thank you for listening to Celtic Stuff Live. Merry Christmas, everybody. Oh, yeah. Merry Christmas.